share like a, a song with me, a song that they enjoy and that they liked. And I, I asked for this because I wanted to personalize the learning space that we would be engaging in. And so when we met synchronously for the first time, um, I had the playlist of all the different songs, you know, that they shared with me. And I had that kind of playing as we were waiting for other students uh, to arrive in the, in the meeting room. Um, so through the introductory kind of synchronous course, um, that first session of the fall semester, um, I did my best also to frame um, our learning experience um, around what is known as the community of inquiry. Um, and so this uh, framework in essence um, examines or rather uh, embraces like the teaching presence, um, also like a social presence and then the cognitive presence. And when I kind of like led with this type of like framework and expectation, it, I think it made sense to my students where I was coming from as their instructor. Um, some of the expectations that I had for them as we would progress and move through the course. And then I also, um, as part of my like student centered um, like value, I also invited them to like co-construct learning outcomes with me as well. And so uh, working in this manner uh, has been effective for me. Um, again, the, the course is uh, surrounding skills-based learning. So I had a little bit more of like flexibility and creative freedom with some of the outcomes that were being generated. And on the whole, um, students have been engaging um, synchronously with me. Um, we are at the midpoint of the semester now, so there have been students that have um, kind of, uh, their, their interactions have been uh, unstable and, and not as consistent, uh, but with the information they shared with me um, in their pre-semester assessment, I've been able to like schedule individual conferences with them and meet with them one on one if that was something that was uh, more um, beneficial for them. Um, so uh, that, that's a little bit of what I've been doing uh, so far. And um, I, I think it's an interesting kind of approach uh, because this is, um, well, I'll be honest, this is only my second semester teaching. <laughs> and it's, I, I, I still think I have like expectations for myself that I don't think I've fully met yet. And it's, it's also been an interesting journey as well because I, I'm also a graduate student. And so I, throughout the day, I'm putting on different hats. I, I, I'm a coach, you know, uh, for some of my students individually. Uh, I'm, you know, teaching the EDT course, um, you know, uh, two times out of the week. Um, I'm also a graduate student, so I'm attending my, my own courses. And so uh, just being able to stay on top of these things, I think for me, um, during this particular time has been one of the more challenging aspects. And um, with that, I, I just wanted to say that uh, the Center for Teaching Excellence and also the graduate school, um, like college teaching certificate kind of pathway has been super helpful for me because they've provided the um, instruments and the tools that I've needed to uh, apply theory to practice, which is, which is a very, very uh, important thing for me especially as I'm moving through my graduate program. All right, great, thank you. So if you didn't see the chat, I finally figured out the record option. Um, so really quickly, because we missed the introduction, I just wanted to let you know that this is a panel sponsored by the Graduate School and also the Center for Teaching Excellence um, to assist our grad students as they're traversing some new terrain, right? So teaching and learning during the pandemic. So that was um, Bobby Litz, so he was our first speaker. And now we're gonna switch it over to Dr. Ellen Yuzerski, so Director for Center for Teaching Excellence. Hello. <laughs> it's great to see everybody. I, I, I think it's fine. Your cameras are off. Um, your mics are off. Um, so the Center for Teaching Excellence had a really interesting spring and summer because we had to deliver all this programming to, to support um, graduate students as well as um, instructors. And so what happened was for me i started learning stuff because i had to because we were delivering all of our professional development through these remote environments and i have to admit that i was i approached it in 
well, this is being recorded, but so I don't care. But the, I approached it in the most stubborn way of anyone else that, that I saw around me. Okay. And what I mean by that is I wasn't willing, it's not like I, I, I want to learn new things, but I didn't want to chase the technology. I didn't want the technology to be driving the decision making about teaching and learning in, in whether it be uh, something where, you know, we're teaching graduate students and faculty about um, some kind of tool or, or, or pedagogy, um, or it was just getting ready to do some summer teaching that I had for my research group as well as um, for, the, for my fall course. And so I approached it in this really stubborn way. And it's like, don't show me the tool first. It's like, show me what I'm going to be able to do learning wise for my students with the tool or the, you know, the strategy. And so I started doing a lot of homework where it was like I knew what I wanted my students to experience or be able to do after some kind of experience and it's like okay so now how are they going to have that experience and it was this mapping right of, of stuff that they did in the classroom with things that they could do online. And so that's how I approached everything. And I went through all the different kinds of things that we would do. So like in the class I'm teaching this fall, um, <clears throat> one of the most important things is that the students run the class. Okay, so I teach it the first two weeks and then the subsequent weeks, um, there are student facilitators or lead discussants. And so I had tried to think about how to do this class online some years before with my colleague uh, in chemistry and biochemistry, Stacey Lowry Bretz, and we just kept hitting the wall because nobody could show us a model for this. Well, here we go. That class was coming up in the fall, so <laughs> I had to figure out in the summer how to do it. And I thought, all right, if all of the tools, if the students could master the tools in the first two weeks and they could go ahead and use them, you know, as they're facilitating, and it worked. Class is going Awesomely, I cannot believe the level of work that these graduate students and undergrads are doing in this class. And I think it's because we didn't focus so much on like the gadgetry and the technologies. It was all about the, the learning principles. And then, okay, so if, if this is how students learn this, then we have to give them a particular kind of experience. Now, if they're not all sitting in the same room, how do we give them that experience, right? So that was kind of the mindset, which I think is, I don't know if it's different, it's just people don't talk about the stubborn approach to teaching online, which would be the name of the paper that I would write about what, what I just did. And so um, I just wasn't willing to, to give up some of the core principles, you know, things I know about how humans learn naturally. Um, I wanted to make sure that we did that. Now, that being said, I would say that the challenges for me have been the fact that there's a pandemic going on, right? So students are struggling to be like they would if there wasn't a pandemic going on, okay? Because their, their lives are just turned upside down and um, and and no one has answers for them because the times are so uncertain. And so that's the part I think that, you know, I, that's where I think I, is my continued learning. And that's where I'm focusing on my own continued learning is how do I continue to support students when, like, I don't know what to do. I don't have any answers, you know. By the way, this is my first pandemic. So that's a thing. Um, yeah, so I would I would much rather spend more time answering your questions and bringing up ideas that you're interested in. So I'm the stubborn one. Who's next? All right, Dr. Daryl Davis, you are next. I went in alphabetical order by first name, so that's how we did this. <laughs> I was busy yawning just now, like I got caught mid yawn. Yeah, because oh, I was talking. Oh. That's why, Daryl. It's all good. No, no, I was stretching because. Every day I'm like this, like, what is going, you know, I watched the debate last night and I'm like, what is going on, right? So I spend all this time thinking, you know, it's, what are students feeling right now, right? And so this whole, this whole process since the fall, um, I've done a lot of rethinking about that, which thank you for asking because I'll share now. So I'm going to focus on the undergrads specifically. I have two courses that are really heavily enrolled in first year students. And that's like a really big deal to me right now because they just, you know, they just turned 18, 16, 17, whatever. They just got here. 
and look at what they found, right? It's like, okay, it's totally messed up. So I have four areas that really occupy a lot of my thought right now. The first is content. My thinking is that, and this is all things that are in the works, right? So totally, if you ask me tomorrow, I might totally change my mind. I don't think content is king, right? I used to feel like I got to teach these 12 chapters and now I don't. I don't, it's not imperative that they learn that exact term with that definition right right this instant so i feel like like I, re, I i just give myself a little permission to back off the content a little bit and and i and i have some verification for this because i i just gave the uh, cte bare bone survey thing where students write responses that was pretty cool yeah that's the problem with, this, with that instrument though they write responses and then you got to read those responses but i get the sense that that they themselves are concerned with the amount of work that they have to do right now, right? So they say, I can't keep up. And so I'd be like, well, yeah, tough, this is school, except right, it's not just school right now. So I'm like really sensitive to that. So assignments that I would say like, well, here's an exercise to practice this concept, right? I'll give you, you know, eight problems. Maybe, maybe I could just give you five, right? I can actually reduce the content where I still feel comfortable with what we're delivering, but I'm really sensitive to just the amount of work that students have to do now in a completely different format. I feel like tons of faculty simply dump what they had online, boom. You know, this is what I did last semester, Shh, import canvas, let's go. This is school, you're an adult, get responsible. Like I, I cannot see that. Like to me, that's like awful, right? But I think this is what students are up against. I, I hope this is not the majority of their experiences, but you know, that's not going to happen in my class. The second point is pacing in the class. I'm like a fast talker and I'm like, you know, we got to cover stuff. My class is totally slowed down now, like slowed down. As in, there are some times in the class where you can see these kids struggling to stay focused in the class. You see it. So what's the point of just like hammering through content just to get that done? You could literally take one minute of your time, right? One minute of your time to say like, hey, okay, let's just pause and I'm gonna look. So Veronica, what's going on? Yeah, you answer me in 15 seconds and we can move forward, right? There's no point in hammering, just slow down the pace of the class, totally works for me. I'm just going to say that they still have glossy eyes and I still think they're struggling, but you know, we're trying, we're, we're trying. The third is the interaction with students. So we have to give feedback on assignments, et cetera. But every single day I get two or three students emailing me saying like, uh, I, I'm not feeling well. That's, you know, that's slang for, I really have COVID. They don't want to say it. Um, I don't feel well, I might not be in class today, right? I'm like, well, we're on Zoom, it's okay, right? But what I've started doing now is if I get that email the following day, so I'm trying to respond to emails just literally faster, I'll say like, how are you feeling today, right? Because it's an actual person who is in quarantine or they're going to be in quarantine or their roommate just got tested and now they're worried because now they have to get tested. I feel like the human, the human part of this thing, I know nobody here, just by, by virtue of like you being here tonight, like I know that you understand this, but we have tons of faculty who I, uh, like I, I really suspect that this is not the case for them. They forget that these kids are actual people and they don't know what it's like to be worried that you're sick or that you got your roommate sick, right? That's like a real concern. And I think we need to like remember that when we're talking to and about these kids. Anyway, so I just asked them like, how are you doing? And you'd be surprised. They just wanna write and say, well, I, I think I'm feeling, you know, and, and get it off their chest and they just need somebody to talk to. I think it goes a long way, a simple question like that. The third, the fourth is, um, this is the second week that I've actually had in, in-person class. So on a Monday, Wednesday, Monday we're on Zoom, 
Wednesday we were like in person. It's nerve wracking. I don't want to walk in the building, period, right? I don't want to walk into Harrison. There's nobody in McGuffey. You know, when the, do you know when you walk in and the lights are off and then when you walk in the hallway, the lights come on? It's, it's dead, right? That's eerie. So you walk into the class and first year students are just so excited to just be in that space, right? They want to come to class. They're like, you totally should have class. I said, fine. The thing is that teaching to 25 students in Harrison Hall and another 42 virtually is not easy, right? That you have to pay attention. So, so for example, the chat, you could tell students online, okay, you, probe, you, you, you pose a question and you, you tell the online students like, okay, put it in the chat. Okay, who's monitoring that? Fine, I'll get a student, right? So a student's monitoring it. I don't know if it's right or wrong, so I gotta go read it now. Do you know what it is to go to the teacher station that has one monitor? I have two in front of me. And you have to switch between tabs to find the correct screen, to then ask a question online and wait for the students to can't find their mute button. Like that, I mean, it's just overload, right? It's overload. So it's a completely fantastic idea if you're comfortable with it. I'm not to go in the class and talk to students, but I think, I think we need to understand that teaching live people and remote people that's, that is a lot to do. Every class, I literally have to memorize my slides because I can't go back between slides, Zoom, chat, and the browser. Like, I mean, how, you know, that's a lot of clicking. And we're not even talking about putting people into groups yet, right? That's a lot of overload, right? So if you do go into the classroom, First of all, double think about it because the minute you tell students you're going into the classroom and you do it one time, it's like social security. You can't take it away then. They love it then, especially if they're first years. So think about that carefully and understand that it's, it's, it's going to be a mess. And I think if you prepare students by saying, hey, man, this is going to be a mess, we'll try it. They'll totally be game, but don't expect that you won't leave that classroom completely exhausted. And like, you know, actually you just got to prepare for the next class. So whatever. Okay, good. That's it. All right. Thanks, Daryl. So we're going to switch it over to Dr. Veronica Barrios. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I commend you for being here. I just taught a class, so I'm like ready to sleep a little. Um, in any event, I am in family science. I have been at Miami two years. I just entered my third. Um, a little bit about the two classes I teach because it's dictated how I teach. I teach family violence or interpersonal violence and that's a capstone course, so a lot of writing. And the other course I'm teaching is called Culturally Informed Practices where I'm teaching social workers about white privilege and anti-racism. Fun, fun. Both of those topics are too heavy to disengage from. Um, my family violence class was content heavy so I could trust that I can give the content the students can go through it and they're writing self-reflections every week. But the other course, I couldn't trust that process for myself. I distrusted the process because I wanted to make sure that I was able to unpack the content with my students. So two things happened. Ellen, I, I was resistant to online instruction. As a matter of fact, I had no materials other than a syllabus online <laughs> and like the assignment tab so students could turn things in. I didn't own a mic, I didn't own a camera, nothing. Because I believe in learning through discussion and in doing things in a team-based fashion where I break my students up into small groups and we all jive over the topic. And I could not foresee how to do that online. So I made one of my classes asynchronous. I don't meet with them at all, the family violence class, because that was content heavy. And so I thought that it would be overkill to expect them to read the content and then show up to class for me to go over the content and then give them activities based on the content. And so I said, hold on, slow down. These are seniors and graduate students for the most part. I'm gonna let them do their thing and I will engage them through their weekly reflections and their weekly activities and feedback. And that's what I've been doing. 
Um, with my other class, I decided to hold synchronous classes just five times in the semester. And the rest of the time, I hold discussion hours that they can join if they want to. The reason I also chose that is because I have students in China and Portugal and in other time zones. And so it was, I was trying to be student centered and it'd be unfair to expect my students to show up when there's an eight hour, 12 hour difference and to be all chipper and ready to go. <laughs> um, also internet access issues, um, having to shut off their VPNs, dealing with uh, Google sites being shut down by different countries. It was just too much, too many barriers that I didn't want to add to my students. So I removed um, the, asynch the synchronous portion of my class. The second thing I did was that I became way lenient. So my usual way is it's not in, it's not graded by, right? Like with all my assignments, cause we're all adults. Well, that's still true, right? It's still my syllabus and I still present that way. However, I, I also, if a student reaches out to me and says I couldn't do this or I didn't get to this, I'm lenient. I've been accepting things, which I normally wouldn't do unless I see it's like a trend, like two or three weeks and you're still doing the same thing. Then I'm like, get your life because I have one too. And so then that ends. Um, the third thing I've been doing is reaching out. When someone has missed an assignment more than once, I'll reach out. Hey, how's it going? Are you okay? What's going on? I noticed. I noticed. I see you. I'm waiting for you to talk to me, right? Just to give them that opportunity to talk, kind of what Daryl was saying, like give them the opportunity to connect. Um, the other thing I do is I did, I always do a midterm evaluation. And so I just did mine last week for both, two weeks ago for both of my classes. And I made changes as a result. I made changes immediately and I'm still making changes. For one of my classes, I got rid of some assignments. Like, why the hell do they have to do this? I could just, I could just not do it. That's it, not doing that one. For my other class, um, the family violence class, content heavy, I don't feel as comfortable removing assignments, but I allow them instead of typing up their responses like they always did, they can give me a video or an audio clip responding. So I don't have, they don't have to sit down and read. They can just talk to me for two minutes and be done with the assignment. Right. So th I, I've tried to do that. I've also moved due dates to make it more accommodating for students. Um, I, I have my notes here. So reducing the load. Um, I've also been honest about like my process and my discomfort with students. You know, when I've made mistakes with things, um, I've told them I've used screencasts for the first time, some recording lectures and I fumble in them. I don't redo it. I'm just like, well, that's part of it. If I was in the class, I don't have a pause button and a reset, right? So I just fumble and keep moving and I laugh and I just let it go. And the last thing is I'm trying to protect students. So given, especially with my other class and the, the type of content we're engaging, anti-racism, white supremacy, privilege, um, I have a handful of students of color, which is a lot for, usually for one of a Miami class, right? Sometimes I don't have any. And so because I'm not in person, I haven't used small groups up until tonight because I didn't want to stick my students in a group where I couldn't actually hear what was happening as it was happening or read facial expressions or, or manage what was going on. So tonight I use small groups and I put all my students of color in the same group so that they wouldn't have to deal with microaggressions in their small groups. And I explained that I was doing that. I let my class know that this is what I was doing. And I explained to them that eventually we'll work into mixing up our small groups. But for now, I needed to make sure that people felt supported in their own space, especially given that we're online and I can't monitor and make sure that they're safe the same way I could in the classroom. And so those are the things that I've done. Um, I'm surviving, kind of thriving, not sure yet. We'll see. All right, thank you, Veronica. So we are going to open up the floor now for questions. We've got, yeah, roughly about 25 minutes left, give or take 20 minutes. Um, for anyone in the audience who would like to pick our panelists' brains. So you can type it in the chat, which is open, or you can unmute your microphone and ask a question that way too. <clears throat> so really quickly for the panelists, um, do you guys uh, have students, like, like right now there's no, there's no video, right? And everybody's muted 
in a class of, in my class of uh, 60 plus students, doesn't matter, right? Because you have like 20 or so students who are, who are on, like I can see them. But when there are too many blank screens with like, you know, names that are kind of funky because they don't know how to change it. And then they were being funny at one time and it's all stuck on that name. Yeah, I find it like totally disorienting, right? Like, who am I talking to? Where are, what are you doing? And so sometimes you're try I'm trying to like present information and I see the screen and they're just, and I feel like there's a threshold, right? Where there are too many people who I can't see. But I totally understand that I don't want to force students to be on the video um, for like tons of reasons, right? But, but for my own self, it is hard to keep talking when I could be talking to myself, literally. So, Daryl, I would say that maybe you're talking too much. I mean, that, I mean, that so, is, so one of the reasons. So, so you know, I, I want to make sure we get to um, Alyssa's question in there, but, but one of the things that I think you know, I I always sound like, oh, I'm the stubborn one. Well. The thing is, I'm not stubborn with students, right? In fact, I've taken all of the student-centered parts of my face-to-face -face class and found technologies, brute force, get to, we, we're, we're doing all of that. And there aren't very many times where people are talking, unless they're working in a small group and then going back to Veronica's thing about monitoring, that's tricky. So what we've done is that we have, everybody has to have like, um, their work has to be going on in a shared workspace that I can see and monitor the whole, whole time. So whether it be like a Jamboard or a Google Doc or a Google Sheet are the areas where, where they're working. And so um, the only time that I'm actually talking to the class okay, is as a member of the kind of Q&A role that students will have during some of the activities. And so the, the content is embedded in the activities that students are doing in small groups. And so um, there's really, there's no like mm, content delivery at all in, in, this, in the synchronous classes. So I think you should stop talking. I don't know. I mean, I could think <laughs> about that, but right now we have like, it's gotta be like a 60, 40 ratio of me presenting something and students working in, in their groups doing whatever I mm -hmm. assign them. Getting that ratio to like zero hundred or That's 10, tough, huh? Yeah. Well, I think that maybe you could take, how about this? What if you just totally shrunk those blocks? So instead of having the student, like, having you talking about stuff and then the students doing a group. And if it's like this, you know, maybe break this up into like three little kind of bursts and then the students get to actually, you know, synthesize the content, make sense of it in, in, with their activities. And so those transitions, you'll have a lot more during a class meeting. That would be one suggestion. And then that way, you know, they're engaging because you're seeing them like generating work, especially if you're using like a shared workspace or something, you know, where, where you can see them like doing stuff. I know they do their work in their groups. When I check in the groups, all the videos are on. I rarely that's, see students working in groups and their videos. Not. That's so, cool. That's cool. So I think so if that's working for you, I think you totally capitalize on that. It throws it's, me off it, as well, Daryl, like, um, and it just happened tonight and I said to them, because it's a graduate course and there's a certain amount of sharing that needs to happen. And so I told them, it's fine if your camera is off, but if I don't hear you or if I can't read what you're suggesting or you, that you're participating, you're not present. And so you can leave or you can start participating, right? Because just being a passive learner is not enough, particularly in my class, because of the type of content being presented. So I know that that can vary by content. So Alyssa had a question. She said, have you noticed an increase in your workload for students, such as assigning more work to ensure that they are engaged slash understanding the content? So if anyone wants to jump in, go ahead. Oh, I think it's been, it's, you have to strip everything down. And I think Daryl made some really good points about the fact that life 
is going on in a really different way and people's um, time and availability to engage um, has been has been significantly compromised and so you have to make the decision like what's the most important thing um, and so Daryl talked about the importance of connecting, you know, with with the students. Um, I think it's also it's a good it take it makes you take a long hard look at to, at the curriculum and you go what is essential, you know. And the reality is that if we're focusing on like enduring kinds of skills and really deep concepts, you know, if they master those, they can go off and learn all the other little stuff if they need to. You know, like maybe they'll need it for another class or whatever. But if we zoom in on the things that are really core to our discipline, um, that'd be better in general, not just in a pandemic. That would actually be better because the curriculum is just bloated as all get out. And the tyranny of content, I'm like done. I'm just done with it. It's like, I don't care that the textbook is like this. I just don't care because I know how textbooks are written and all the goofy people who review them have to have their stupid pet thing in it. So then the textbook ends up this big so that they can sell it. So I'm just so over that. Subvert and teach a good class. That's my advice. I ended up with more work, um, my students doing more work in the violence class Mm -hmm. because they're reading the content and the reflections part of every week, uh, what I normally would have done, but then the activities that I would have done in class with them, they're doing on their own. And then writing, writing and they're doing a short audio reflection, like a one page reflection or a quick audio clip. But I, that's added work for me. And I also hate, I hate quizzes and tests and they're taking a weekly quiz. It's only worth a point, one, one whole point every week. Um, because that's how much I hate them. But it's it's also a way that I can help them make sure that they're getting getting information out of the reading that uh, I would have normally discussed in class. And that's because we're asynchronous. So it's more work for them, but it's a hell of a lot more work for me too. And it, I'm not happy. I'm waiting to go back to class. <laughs> yeah, I would say my workload is through the roof, but the students are doing fine. <laughs> At least I, in this class. Yeah, I was like, I would also <laughs> say the same thing. My own workload is through the roof because I'm teaching online synchronously for three classes. So yeah, I would agree. My workload has increased for sure. Students are also doing awesome though, which makes me super happy. I've gotten really good feedback. So that makes me smile. Makes it worth it. All right, so we have another question in the chat. So how is Thanksgiving week going to impact how you do final exams? And Veronica says no finals with numerous exclamation points. <laughs> and then LOL. <laughs> yeah, I like I didn't have a final exam for the class. They have a culminating um, paper, you know, like the final version of that paper they're going to turn in again to balance their work and ruin my life like at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's more in line with the goals of the class than an exam. Yeah, so my class won't have any traditional final exams either. They have, um, I like to call it a creative application project. So some of my classes will be doing a choose your own adventure story. So they'll be picking a crime theory and then using that theory to write like a story tree versus an actual, like they don't have time to write a whole book. Um, some are gonna do a political cartoon. So it'll be really good for them because I like those kind of creative things. The students have a lot of fun, but it also lets them have an avenue to apply in a creative way what they have learned, which I think is really great. So I'm muted. Bobby, Daryl, Veronica, do you want to talk about anything you might be doing to tackle Thanksgiving break and then finals? I have a couple of scenarios for exam, um, but I, I, I cannot say like I have decided, right? There's kind of like open it for a week, right? I, I don't have an option to, I don't feel like I have an option to not give a final. So 
I don't know. I don't know. I am still thinking of it's it's scheduled already, right? It's kind of there on their calendar to be done. They'll get a few days to do it um, at the end of the semester before Thanksgiving. I believe it's before Thanksgiving. But I feel like there are better ways to do it though. So I'm not sure what's gonna happen there. Yeah, sorry. All right, so we have a couple more questions in the chat. So Miranda asked, is there anything you would do differently for the spring semester if classes are still predominantly online or hybrid? Hmm. I would get rid of some of my assignments for sure. Um, even though they, they didn't ask me to do that, I would um, find ways to combine assignments so that they're not perceived as busy work or graded as busy work even, um, but rather have a stronger impact. So for example, instead of weekly reflections, just having them do a module reflection on like the child abuse stuff. And then another one on the adult forms of violence and, and just break it up so that it's chunked and they can build up to that culminating um, assignment opposed to weekly assignments. I'm gonna agree with Veronica that, I, you know, one of my classes, the 200 level classes, I have some TAs and there's a lot of moving parts in that class. And so it is really difficult for, especially the TAs to, I mean, they, they're going to school as well and so they have to learn stuff and turn in papers and then they have to navigate this whole so i feel like their workload is just way higher than mine to tell you the truth and and so i'm going to spend some time after the semester to strip some things from that course for sure you know they yeah, especially things that were like, oh, this would be neat to have in the course type thing where you got, you have some value and the value costs, you know, it just costs us some time to grade something, but it's not really core essential core, but it's really cool to have in it. Um, yeah, we're going to get rid of that for sure. So my students work in teams and I've never taught a team-based course online. So this has been a whole new adventure this semester for me. So I did some trainings for folks who had done team-based learning online and they had recommended to keep the team smaller, like three to four students. And based on my experiences thus far, I'd actually go back to having what I would have in an in-person class. I would have five to six students because I don't think when they gave that advice, they considered the pandemic, right? So you do, like Daryl had said earlier, students are getting sick. They may not be able to attend class. Um, and that could continue in the spring, right? Until we have a vaccine. And so what I'm seeing is sometimes a team of four will all of a sudden be a team of two. Um, so that would be one thing I would do different. I would increase the team sizes. There are three to four right now. So I'd up them to back to five or six for teamwork. I, I'm not sure what I would do differently. I just would love to better understand some of the places where I'm struggling, like to calibrate, like I, I, I'm having trouble calibrating what is an appropriate ask of the students in terms of time spent and, and workload. And, and I think I've thought about those things before, just, you know, in regular old semesters, you know, trying to, to generate, um, expectations that were appropriate and fair but then also you know hold them to high standards because I think they can get there um, how like as the pandemic goes on and how that throughout the duration of it I feel like every time I start to get calibrated or figure stuff out I'm wrong and or I'm right for this group of students but not this other group of students and so um, you know, what would I do different in spring semester? I think I would like interview every single one of my students first. <laughs> That's a ridiculous idea, but <clears throat> it's the, it feels like it's the only way to solve this problem that I'm having in terms of my um, not having enough understanding of, of, of what they need. 
All right, so we have a question from Alyssa that asks, how are we taking care of ourselves? So who would like to ask or answer, not ask, you know what I meant. <laughs> Um, so self-care for me um, looks um, a lot like just going outside and venturing outside. I'm very much a like an outdoorsy person and I'm gonna like mute my video really quick and show you that like fishing is like one of my favorite things to do. So the more that I can fish like the better and with the fall pattern like arriving um, there's a lot more like different species of fish that I can target and so that's been it doesn't sound as exciting to many folks, but it's really exciting for me. So um, just being out and not staring at a screen, you know, for eight plus hours a day, um, that has been one of the like things that I'm doing in terms of self-care. I'm trying to be um, patient with myself. So because of the way I designed the class, I have roughly on a good week, just 80 assignments to grade, and those are written assignments. Um, so I'm trying to be patient with myself that sometimes I'm not going to get them all done in the same day or even in the two days um, where I normally would beat myself up over those things. And also <laughs> um, removing myself from work, like so doing things other than work. Um, this semester, I find myself working more than I normally would have engaged and not in the areas that I need for tenure, <laughs> which is a whole other conversation, um, but engaging in other activities, whether it's watching TV or going out or exercising. My partner made me exercise this semester, so things like that. <laughs> I've been thinking about exercising too. Yeah, I mean, people walk. My wife, she walks. Some people run. I can't run if it's not a sport and I can't play a sport. And so uh, I coached the club soccer team and I went out last Tuesday, you know, told them to stay far away from me. And I felt really bad because I couldn't, you can't do anything with anybody. I, I played tag with my daughter this evening. That was really cool, I think. Yeah, you just run around. <laughs> it's so weird. I change these action figures behind me periodically. That's really self-care. Yeah, I love it. Simple things. Uh, I think it is the simple things right now. Like I bought a Halloween coffee mug. It made me smile. Now I drink out of it every day. So yeah, you know, and it's not October, but that's okay. I already decorated for Halloween too. <laughs> All right, so um, Haley has a question for us. She said, have you been providing much in the way of additional materials from elsewhere on the web? So YouTube videos, articles, et cetera, to help supplement student learning for your asynchronous classes? And if so, how have those been received by the students? I'm teaching a synchronous class, so that doesn't apply to me. So I did it for my asynchronous class. Um, so the activities I normally would have done in class, some of the videos I normally would have shown in class and made discussion groups around, um, they're doing on their own. I'm getting mixed reviews. So some students are like, I'm not really, well, I had like two or three students in that eval say, I'm not really getting too much out of that activity. But then I've had many more saying like they're enjoying, because it's a lot of self quizzes and things of that nature, that they're enjoying it. What I don't enjoy is that then, I can offer the material, but then I've, I added the assignment to it portion. And so I'm like, should I just have added the material? But then I, I was a student not so long ago. And if I don't really have to use that material, I probably wasn't going to use it. And so I, I didn't want to do that either. So I, yeah, I'm still struggling with that, but the students seem to be okay with the supplemental stuff. All right, so additional questions. We have about five minutes left. And Rosemary is thinking about exercise. <laughs> I think that's a Daryl quote. 
Oh, I see. Oh, I did miss the quotes. I am thinking. Yeah. That is funny. Yeah, I don't know. Rose, I don't know. what. Yeah, I mean, we should all think of, I mean, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but you didn't say you were exercising. You're like, no, I am not. thinking uh, about exercising not for self-care. <laughs> I feel like if I dream about playing soccer, that must count for something, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Burn some kind of calories. Sure. So I do have one question for everyone. So looking ahead, you know, you've had the transition in the spring, right, which was crazy as one adjective to use, prep time over the summer for the fall. So if you had one piece of advice to give to one of our graduate student instructors as they teach their own classes, what would that piece of advice be moving forward as we are still in the pandemic? You, you can go, Ellen. I think you're Ellen, muted, though. I think your microphone is off, Ellen. Is that good? <laughs> I pressed the little button by accident. All right, so, so the advice I would have is, um, this is advice I give people all the time. This isn't just like a pandemic thing, it, but it's, don't focus on what you're going to do as the teacher. Focus on what the students need to do to learn. And if you have that orientation when you're planning a class, it's more likely going to be about them and not about you as the instructor. Um, and so, so you start asking like really important questions like, okay, what do the students need to be able to do at the end of this class? So you start thinking about the goals and then you say, all right, well, how am I going to help them, you know, learn how to do that? And what are the ways that they could learn that? And then what materials would they need and what kinds of interactions? And then once you get to the, like, the nuts and bolts of it, that's when a lot of the, the, the technologies and the strategies come in that are associated with, with online um, kinds of learning. And so, um, that I think that's the place where the Center for Teaching Excellence has been doing a lot of work and a lot of consulting. It's not just like go learn this tool, but it's more like, well, how do you implement this, and and how do you plug this into to the class in a meaningful way so that you know the students meet the learning outcomes. So, um, so I would say if you're stuck, come to the CTE, and I would love to meet with you and help support you in your development to help your students. And we have um, lots of people who, who could help. So will you call us? We'd, we'd like you to call us. So I'm gonna echo some of what Ellen said. Um, I, I have two TAs and they really work well together. The TAs I have, they always seem to work well together um, as, as a pair, but this semester in particular, uh, they've done a really good job of reaching out, right? So, for example, I feel like graduate students, you know, high achieving, they don't want to disturb you. And so they try to figure everything out themselves pretty much. Um, but some things they, you know, for example, the whole kind of like teaching in person and Zoom at the same time. Like we've had to kind of walk through that, just like how that mechanically happens in the classroom, right? So they've really done a good job of like leaning on each other and they would just text me and it would be like, oh yeah, we have a question. And I'd say, sure, okay. And I just turn on Zoom on my phone and we were talking about something. So I would, I would hope that graduate students who are teaching right now are in an environment where they have people who are really supportive of what they're doing and will take a minute or two, not just to say, hey, you're doing an awesome job and you're a great person, but to actually like have a conversation and help problem solve with you. Like that would be a really, I'm really hoping that that's like your reality for sure. Yeah.
I would say make sure that any anything you're putting into your course is serving a purpose other than just an assignment because you think there needs to be an assignment that week. Um, so all of it should have a purpose um, greater than how that it's how it's been done or that you think you need something or that they need something to grade. Um, that That's definitely an adjustment that I will plan to be making, but that I would recommend as well. Um, so I, I just wanted to share an acronym really quickly, and that acronym is uh, VUCA, that's V-U-C-A. Um, it's often used in like the context of business, uh, but that, that's in essence like short for like volatility, uncertainty, uh, complexity, and ambiguity. I think all of us, I mean, it's safe to say that we're navigating all of these things collectively. And in terms of like an approach moving forward, I, I'm doing my best to frame like my interactions and my instructions from like an anti-deficit type of approach and have it look and feel um, more, more of like an asset-based approach. Like I, I know virtual learning, rather remote learning, um, isn't as like productive for some folks. Face-to-face uh, -face interaction, traditional instruction is more and more preferred. Um, in, in the absence of that, I think this is really a great time to challenge ourselves as educators to see what we can do in terms of um, what changes we can make moving forward. Uh, I'm still trying to determine what that looks like for me. Um, and um, yeah, just, just wanted to share that. All right, thank you so very much. Teaching is a journey. I can say that for sure, right? We grow as we learn and we do more over time. So I wanted to say thank you very much to all our panelists tonight. We're actually two minutes over, but this has been absolutely wonderful. And I'm very thankful for all of you who attended this evening. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. And then if anybody wants to hang out for a few minutes afterwards, feel free, but I understand if you are good to go and you've taken some nuggets of wisdom with you. And hopefully we'll see you all again at another event. Kristen, real quick, um, before we let our presenters go. Um, hi everybody, I'm Haley, I'm a GA in the graduate school. Um, I would like to give our presenters a gift just to say thank you for being here tonight. And I was just curious if you were all on campus. Bobby, I know how to find you, but I didn't know if anyone else had office hours. If not, I'm happy to um, mail them. Oh my gosh, Haley.